Um, I'd like to thank all of you for coming this evening. It's good to see a, a busy crowd. As you can see around you here this evening, there are, if I'm not mistaken, three if not four uh, TV stations here, uh, one of which is live, but some of it's uh, pre-recorded. Um, you've got a very busy evening. There's an hour and a half, so I'll just take you through a few basics first of all. The bathroom, for, all, for those of you who need to go at some point in the point evening, is just out on the left-hand side here. Um, in terms of the run of the evening, there will be myself and then two speakers and a short film. And then there will be a comfort break. Each of the speakers will be about five minutes long. So they'll be short and will give you an opportunity to hear different perspectives. Then there will be that comfort break. And if you can come back in, there will be another three speakers and another short film. And then there will be an opportunity for a Q&A. And if we've still got time left at the end of that hour and a half, we'll get a chance to meet each other and uh, catch up informally. Okay. Um, first of all, obviously, thank you for coming, and the reason we're here, obviously, today is because it's the eighth uh, anniversary of the Bahraini uprising. Um, inspired by uprisings in Egypt and Tunisia, Bahrain youth organised peaceful protests. I'll tell you what, I can hardly read this because there's hardly any light. I do apologise. Inspired by uprisings in Egypt and Tunisia, Bahraini youth organised peaceful protests to demand political reforms and greater respect for human rights in 2011. On the 14th of February 2011, thousands of Bahrainis took to the streets only to be violently rep repressed by the armed security forces. And for those of you who remember that time, what we saw on the television screens at the square dubbed Freedom Square, I can remember where I was in the world, and I'm sure many of you in this room will remember that point as well. However, the Bahraini state continues to ignore calls to respect human rights. There have been constituent, uh, consistent reports of widespread and systematic claims of torture, rape, and sexual assault of political prisoners, which have not yet been thoroughly investigated by the state. The speakers who I'll introduce you to shortly will recount the protests of 2011 and commemorate the victims. They'll also speak about the political prisoners who are being detained and tortured in Bahraini um, prisons as a result of expressing the will of the people. We have a short period of time to get through, so if you can make your questions and replies at the end uh, quite short, and we should be able to get through as many questions as possible. In terms of human rights, as we know in Bahrain, a human rights record in civil society has deteriorated substantially within the last two years. Reprisals targeting prisoners, journalists, human rights defenders and their relatives have become commonplace. Indeed, the only independent newspaper, Al Wazat, was forcibly closed in 2017, while at least 15 journalists are currently imprisoned. There is currently an estimate of 4,000 prisoners convicted in relation to political unrest within a population of approximately 800,000 individuals. Those individuals have been arbitrarily arrested, detained and imprisoned, often with the use of torture and sexual assault to extract false confessions and subjected to unfair trials and a deeply flawed criminal justice system. In fact, in 2018 report, Human Rights Watch stated, and I quote, civilian and military courts continue to convict and imprison peaceful dissenters, including prominent human rights defenders and opposition leaders under the guise of national security. Let me turn my attention a little bit to prison conditions. The conditions of detention of several Bahraini human rights defenders and political dis dissidents held at Joao pris Prison exhibit a new worrying pattern of abuse that includes a denial of basic rights, particularly a general neglect for prisoners' health and welfare. Political prisoners are targeted for continued punishment while in prison, including the, in the interrupted access to medication, denial of specialist care, and necessary and degradating degrading searches and interrupted family visits. And I've heard personally, in fact, from one or two people in this room, family members who are in prison just now experiencing those awful conditions. In July 2018, the UN Human Rights Committee expressed concerns for the, and I quote, inhuman prison conditions, including serious overcrowding, unsanitary conditions, inadequate access to drinking water, and unhygienic toilet facilities. And I'm sure every one of you in this room find this to be deplorable. Prison conditions in Bahrain's only female detention centre have been criticised internationally for not complying with internationally recognised standards. And Amnesty International, for instance, has recently detailed the ill-treatment of the Bahraini female political prisoners held in Isa Town Prison. On the 16th of September last year, Isa Town prison guards, led by the commanding officer, physically assaulted political prisoners. Let's turn also to the death penalty. Despite pressure from the UN and the international community, the death penalty remains an integral part of the Bahraini legal system. There are currently 20 nationals in death row 
all sentenced, all on political cases. In January 2017, capital punishment resumed within the kingdom. Three torture victims were executed six days after the court of cessation upheld their death sentence. This is widely considered to be the first phase of executions related to political unrest in Bahrain since 1996. And of the 20 death row inmates, five individuals are at imminent risk of execution, having exhausted all domestic remedies. So where is the UK government in all of this? Well, I'd like to touch upon in more details the UK government's lack of criticism towards abuses in Bahrain. Britain is a key ally to Bahrain and has continued to fund the training of local oversight bodies who have been criticised by the UN Committee Against Torture for being neither independent nor effective. Indeed, since 2012, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office has spent over £5 million of British taxpayers' money on technical assistance to train Bahraini institutions for the purpose of, and I quote, strengthening the rule of law and implementing justice reform. However, and this is the important point, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office has refused to disclose information on these new funds on the basis of national security and other exemptions relating to the involvement of the intelligence services. Indeed, the Foreign Affairs Committee published a report in September criticising the Foreign Office's lack of transparency and asserting that it precluded the accountability of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. As I stand here speaking to you today, the UK government, by any international standards, should be held to account. In terms of our arms sales, one of our speakers, who I also happen to share the Committee on Arms Export Control, Lloyd Russell Moyle, will be speaking about shortly. We sit on this committee together and we have been taking evidence for the key problems and challenges of selling arms overseas. And here's a crucial point. While Bahrain's human rights record is deteriorating, the UK continues its close ties with the country, including an extensive arms trade. In the last three years alone, the UK has secured over £67 million pounds worth of military export licenses to Bahrain. And in 2017, Bahrain bought over 30 million of British arms, despite Bahrain being a Foreign and Commonwealth Office human rights priority country. The figures in 2017 account for just over one third of the approved military arms export value to Bahrain in the last 10 years. And finally, early last year, the UK opened a naval base in Bahrain. So what we know is using an array of tools in repression, including harassment, Arbitrary, arbitrary detention and torture, the government of Bahrain has led to disastrous decline in the human rights situation in the country. And the UK government has a role to play. It must act now by strengthening the response to the deteriorating situation. They must lead the international community to publicly condemn these human rights violations. And a message to all parliamentarians here today, not just in this room but across Parliament, regardless of whichever political party they are, human rights is not a luxury. And it's not something that we can all take for granted. And it doesn't just happen on our shores. You have to fight for it, for each and every person in this world. If we truly share the values of international law, democracy, freedom of expression, both political and otherwise, fairness and social justice, then we must all cons continue consistently to campaign and stand up for those rights. Thank you. <laughs> Doughty, sorry, Doughty Street's international human rights team and part of the Doughty Street Equalities team. She's an experienced trial barrister and former chair of the Bar Human Rights Committee. In 2014, she successfully judicially reviewed a decision by the DPP that Prince Nazar bin Hamad al Khalifa of the Kingdom of Bahrain was protected from prosecution for alleged torture by state immunity. I hand over to Kirsty. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll seats at this point. <laughs> ...of the UK when it comes to enforcing human rights. Now, Obviously, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office plays a very central role uh, when looking at uh, how the state, the UK, is interacting with Bahrain and what it is doing uh, concerning uh, human rights violations in Bahrain. And there's, there's substantial evidence of the human rights violations, and others will sp speak more of those, of torture, uh, of uh, imprisonment without due process, of a lack of an independent uh, due process. And uh, also um, there are uh, very uh, stark examples such as uh, the case of Nabil Rajib where he, as you all know, very recently had his sentence of five years imprisonment upheld by the appeal court in Bahrain uh, and that 
effectively means he's in prison for a critical tweet. Uh, so immediately there is an interference with a right of freedom of expression. You then look at uh, punishment there. Is it proportionate? Uh, unlikely that you would find anyone that would consider that is proportionate. Uh, and uh, so very strong arguments. There's an obvious breach in international law with his imprisonment. But back to the Foreign Office. So what was quite interesting with the Foreign Office was that last year it invited submissions from a number of organizations, uh, those of whom uh, interact with the Foreign Office, and it really invited us to contribute and address certain issues. And um, basically the FCO was looking at how it performs internationally how it performs protecting and promoting human rights in the UN, including its role in the Human Rights Council and its promotion of human rights in the Security Council. It uh, wanted our opinion on how it actually promotes democratic values and rule of law around the world, and also how uh, it, 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 it actually operates to enforce and impact change. So I headed up a uh, small team, I think there was two of us, basically scrabbled to input uh, to the Foreign Office Committee with availability to give oral evidence if required. And a particular focus for us was on Bahrain because it was a compare and contrast. For example, experience with Colombia had been a very positive one working with the embassies and uh, receiving assistance from, from the Foreign Office when working uh, to address human rights violations in Colombia. The experience with Bahrain and uh, the Foreign Office desk here, uh, as well as internationally, was not positive. And it continues not to be positive. The experience has been and remains that what happens within the FCO appears to be that there is uh, a rota, which perhaps is too rapid, of desk officers. So one desk officer will gain some expertise and some connection, uh, and then that person is switched. There's no specific name anymore uh, when dealing with Bahrain for us to communicate with. So we have, I've just pulled up our latest letter, in fact, I was looking at it a few moments ago, uh, where we have it signed off by the Gulf team. So there's not even a name there when we're raising an issue. And that was a letter uh, we received on the 15th of January of this year in relation to, it was a letter we'd written to the FCO and particularly to the Foreign Secretary concerning Nabil Rajab and concerning the uh, uh, Court of Appeals decision and uh, we also refer back to a letter um, that uh, we'd received no reply to that we'd written to Boris Johnson previously. So we had a reply to this one but the reply really uh, was uh, lacking in substance. It basically said uh, that concern had been expressed internationally by uh, Alistair Burt MP, the Minister for the Middle East He'd expressed concern about the five-year sentence. And it says, the British Embassy in Bahrain has closely monitored the hearings of Mr. Rajab. Officials from the embassy regularly attended Mr. Rajab's court hearings, including the handing down of the latest appeal verdict. We have raised the case at senior levels, and our officials will continue to monitor the case closely. But what does that mean? They end by saying, we continue to ur urge Bahrain to protect freedom of expression for all its citizens in line with their international commitments. But again, how do they actually uh, urge that upon Bahrain? Uh, and why is there now not an open door with a name at a high level for barristers such as myself who practice in international uh, human rights law, who uh, have analyzed the legal framework uh, can provide uh, substance uh, from an international, forensic and independent point of view. Why is there no uh, open door now for such dialogue? Um, we've replied recently to say um, you've avoided uh, replying on the suggested meeting in the letter which we requested before Christmas. 
can you respond to that? Uh, and so far, three weeks later, there's been no reply. So back to the input to the uh, Foreign Office, the Foreign Office's uh, own survey of its own um, internal processes. The, the conclusion was that the uh, Foreign Office um, can be a real force for good. And uh, it has certainly internationally in many, many countries uh, assisted myself and others at the Bar Human Rights Committee in particular with work that we've done there, working on supporting and strengthening the rule of law. Uh, examples we've given at Columbia, uh, phenomenal assistance there, and uh, in particular as well, Nigeria. Uh, and in the last two years alone, we'd addressed human rights abuses in over 30 countries. However, Bahrain continues to stand out as one where assistance uh, is at best minimal, where there is a general letter in reply, and at worst, um, at closed. Uh, there, uh, and that has been a shift. So, uh, solutions? Well, uh, solutions are that the Foreign Office uh, should uh, urge Bahrain to allow access now uh, to its prisons. We could easily set up an independent group to inspect uh, the prisons and to take uh, evidence um, of those complaining of torture. Uh, it should also now, in addition, uh, be uh, urging Bahrain to allow access to lawyers. When we last tried a number of years ago, we were refused access. It needs to be urging to allow access in order to uh, monitor and to interview those prisoners who are classified as political prisoners. Uh, this has happened in the past quite successfully where Bahrain has taken a decision to pardon uh, those who have been detained over a number of years for freedom of expression type offences. And it's about time really that much more pressure is put on for that to be implemented and for pardons now uh, to be seen this year for the release of many of those who are serving uh, sentences which they ought not to be serving. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker this evening is actually one of my colleagues. We both sit in the International Development Select Committee together, as well as on the Committee for Arms Export Control. He takes a special interest in British foreign policy in the Middle East and the Gulf region, including condemning the arms export to Saudi Arabia. So I'm going to hand over to Lloyd. Lloyd, you've got approximately five, six minutes. You know what it's like with the pressure, so uh, I'll leave it over to you. So a round of applause quickly to introduce Lloyd. Thank you. And then particularly uh, some cases and the government responses to cases that we've been raising, and then that will lead on to the video that we will uh, then uh, listen uh, to. First of all, um, let me just explain, uh, the British are, uh, are meant to follow an EU system of arms export controls. That means that we shouldn't export where there is clear risk that they will be used for internal repression, that arms exports will be used for uh, international destabilization and breaches of uh, um, humanitarian, international humanitarian law, or where it is um, politically worrying uh, in terms of uh, instability in a region. We shouldn't export where it will lead to poverty and um, a reduction of sustainable development. We shouldn't export if it's a risk to Britain, etc., etc. The first category there, criteria two, is what it's called, is probably the most interesting, internal repression and external um, humanitarian um, uh, 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 breaches. Now, we also know that the British government routinely ignores uh, the rules and criteria it is meant to abide by. Um, I should say that when we talk about weapons, we don't just talk about guns. Guns are very important. Um, uh, to regulate, but we also talk about spyware, cryptography, the ability to disrupt activists and political activities in countries. That is what we're talking about as large parts of the British um, weapons exports. And if I look at what we have exported uh, to Bahrain, and as Chris mentions, it has grown dramatically. In 2008, we exported around half a million pounds worth of goods, slightly more. 
And now in 2017, we are talking about £30 million pounds worth of goods. So this is a huge increase. Just at a time, post-Arab Spring, you would expect it to decrease because of the concerns of human rights being more prominent, because of the concerns around political activists being, um, being uh, captured and uh, um, uh, treated extremely badly, if not um, inhumanely, and uh, the, some aspects of torture. So what we have exported in the latest license that we have approved is a tele intelligence. We have um, uh, supplied military guidance weapons. We have supplied military communications. Uh, we have supplied combat uh, um, uh, uh, and riot gear, shields, helmets. We have um, exported gun silencers. Now, the use of gun silencers is, is, is an interesting one needed for Bahrain because you don't usually use them in open uh, battlefields. You either use them in close combat sniper usage particularly, which you could be using um, in certain conflicts, not particularly used in the Yemeni conflict which Bahrain is involved in. So one would assume that these are for more domestic uses, which then becomes, again, particularly worrying and troubling. And now Britain issues these on what's called an open license. That means we have no idea about the number of these items that are shipped. When I gave you that three, uh, 30 million figure, that was on uh, individual licenses. So all of those items that I've just read to you are on an open license. It's like we have a mini free trade deal, which you can just export as much as you want for those companies without checking, without verification. So it could be that we've uh, exported one gun silencer. It could be that we've exported um, 50 million gun silencers. We really have no idea about scale. And this is part of the problem. But the bigger uh, element that we should be concerned about is the failure to stop um, export controls when we are concerned about internal repression. And clearly, we can see that there is internal repression. And so Chris has mentioned we know this because the British government itself is funding um, programs to try and improve democracy in Bahrain. And what do those programs, if we look in detail, of them do? Well, we've got the CSSF fund, which has two particular prongs. One is train and equip. Train the military, train the police on tactics of how to lock people up and capture people effectively and equip them with the weapons to do so. Or it is propaganda. So the other part of the CCSF is propaganda work, is equipping the government to better tell its narrative, I think is the, is the way that they describe it. But it basically means you are in telling government agents how to better uh, explain away what they are doing and when they are doing it uh, uh, wrong. And it gives a particularly... Um, high level of um, ability for a government to control the narrative in their country if these programs are successful. If they're not successful, there's an argument that Britain shouldn't be spending the money. If they are successful, the worrying case is, well, why is Britain spending the money in countries that we have particular concerns about? Now, let me come on to, let me come on, uh, to uh, Ali al Hadja, who you will hear in a second. I wrote to, um, uh, uh, with um, Lord Scriven to the Foreign Office explaining my concerns. My concerns that they have been denied medical treatment, they have been denied um, uh, support where they need um, operations on the jaw and on uh, the teeth. Amnesty have raised uh, particular problems. We've heard um, that, of course, the UN Human Rights Council in 2018 raised serious concerns about the state of prisons, particularly with political prisoners, and more importantly, the fact that there wasn't a fair uh, process of justice and there wasn't a fair process of monitoring human rights. And we asked uh, the department to look into this and particularly consider their training programs. And Mr. Burt, uh, who is a nice, affable chap, responded back to me saying, um, and this is the letter that came last week, he said, um, 
Thank you very much for raising these issues. We encourage you to raise these with the appropriate Bahrainian human rights oversight bodies. Well, how is that an answer? If we are asking the British government, who is funding uh, the training of those oversight bodies because we believe they are not sufficient, because Britain is part of the Human Rights Council that has written those uh, and adopted those reports. And of course, Britain is opening up numerous uh, military joint ventures with Bahrain to just pass that off. It sounds very much like how they pass off other crimes that we see happening in Yemen and in Saudi Arabia. It is, don't ask, um, you know, kind of, I don't want to see it, and if I don't know it's happening, it's not happening. It's that kind of response. It's inadequate from our government, and it should be a shame on uh, Britain that our government has no ability to really champion cases. Now, I think we've got a video, actually, of, uh, from, uh, fr from Ali al Hajjah, yes. um, and I think it would be nice to hear um, or an audio clip from what he's saying about his uh, condition at the moment. Thank you. A round of applause, applause for that. Just been saved. There we go. Can everybody see that? Okay. Thank you, everybody. It's just after six o'clock, so we're going to take a very short break just now. Uh, so if anybody needs to use the toilet facilities, they're just outside on the left. Um, when you come back, there's a further three speakers. Uh, it will be short speeches, another short video, and then we'll get an opportunity for a Q&A at that time. That's okay with everybody. And somebody asked me, what's the expression? It's if uh, um, the best laid schemes of mice and men gang after glee. Which means, no matter how much you plan for something, things usually cock up, so it's okay. <laughs> Thank you.
be anywhere with something for now to just switch on video it works, recording. It? Just some short videos and a QA at the end, and we're halfway through. Our next speaker is uh, Ali Alfayez. I got that correct? Yep. Yes, thank you. He is a political activist from Bahrain who was in prison during the 1990s, so he can talk about his personal experience. And Ali is the current spokesperson for Bahrain's opposition bloc, a coalition of UK based political activists. So if you can give it a round of applause to introduce Ali. Thank you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I'm sure you heard um, a clear story and details from previous speakers about the human rights situation in Bahrain. Uh, it's deteriorating and uh, nobody can stop Al Khalifa from torturing and intimidating Bahraini people because they call for a democratic transformation. And Bahrain become unstable uh, politically, economically, and even now on the society level, it's becoming an unstable country. Uh, thanks to Britain for that, obviously. British government, not Britain as a so society. Uh, and the root cause of that is the political situation in Bahrain. We have a tribe ruling Bahrain, an absolute monarchy, and unfortunately supported by a democracy like United Kingdom. Um, and today, most of the political society has been dissolved. Uh, Al-Wafaq, Wad, and others, most of the political leaders inside Bahrain are inside jail, serving 25 years and more, some of them. I believe uh, Sheikh Al-Maghdad is serving 100 years, or maybe more than that. And the tyranny, Al-Khalifa tyranny, is now transformed into a military rule. So it's a tyranny and military rule, because you see US Fifth Fleet, you see UK Naval Base, you see Saudi Army, Emirati Army, mercenaries from all over the world. All of them is coming to support Al Khalifa tribe and this tyranny. And that gives you an indication, a clear indication. This is a tribe which rule Bahrain have no political legitimacy whatsoever. Nobody, absolutely nobody is supporting them. If we go today for an election, they will fail. So their choice is to get an outsider to support them and support them in a form of killing, torturing, jailing, stripping people from their nationality and you know, the list go on. Now, they dissolved the political society in Bahrain. They took political leaders inside the jail. And now they are intimidating political activists outside Bahrain. And the case of uh, Al-Arabi, Hakim Al-Arabi, is known now to everyone. They attack Sayyid Ahmed family. And recently, they are intimidating my own family as well. I heard the previous speak, speaker talking about the cost of supporting Al Khalifa in Bahrain. We're talking about millions of pounds to create a fake institution that talk about supporting the regime to transform smoothly to be a democratic and to have a rule of law. That's a total lie. But the cost of supporting democratic transformation is much cheaper for Britain and other countries, and it gives much more interest to those countries. Now, we have to question why Britain took this rule, and that needs a very long session. Unfortunately, today, the tyranny in Bahrain is using somehow democratic institution in Britain, including the parliament, to whitewash 
its image and that's need to be stopped and to end this speech I would like to say two sentences here our people believe that they will be victorious and that could happen very soon um, our people have played the game peacefully within the rule of law. The regime have used all sort of violent tools to suppress our people. They did, he did not succeed. They will not succeed ever. And we call British politicians to come and join Bahraini people and Bahraini opposition to work together to transform Bahrain to be an example of a democracy in the Gulf. Thank you very much. Uh, Dan is a deputy director at Reprieve. Um, he oversees. Hi Dan, how are you? He oversees Reprieve's policy and media teams and coordinates advocacy activity across the organisation. Dan, over to you when you're ready. Thank you, Chris. Thank you all very much. With Bird on the cases of individuals facing execution in Bahrain uh, and the torture and abuses they have suffered, but also about the UK government's role in those cases and the role of UK bodies in compounding the abuses these people have suffered uh, and the role of the UK in potentially compounding the human rights situation in Bahrain, however opposite that may have been from the government's original objective. So the UK has, we know, in the last few years spent more than £5 million of taxpayers' money on what it calls rule of law assistance in Bahrain. And in that time, the size of Bahrain's death row has tripled and Bahrain has broken its long-standing death penalty moratorium. And by every reasonable indicator of the funding and, and assistance the UK has provided, that funding has been a failure. The human rights performance has, has gone down dramatically, and yet this money continues to flow, albeit in a more secretive form, because it was recently announced that the UK was funding its Bahrain assistance through a channel called the Integrated Activity Fund, which is subject to far greater secrecy than the previous funding channel through which this, this money came, and I'll return to that in a moment. <coughs> but first I'd quite like to talk about the type of assistance the UK is providing and how this manifests itself in individual cases. So the UK has funded two bodies, which, which other speakers have, have mentioned, uh, the Ombudsman of the Ministry of the Interior and the Special Investigations Unit, both of which nominally have a remit to investigate human rights abuses that are carried out in Bahrain's jails and criminal justice institutions. But in fact, an actual assessment of the Ombudsman and SIU's performance, as well as their organizational and institutional status within Bahrain, shows that these bodies are not independent bodies by any reasonable stretch. And in the cases where it matters the most, where we're seeing the gravest human rights abuses they may, have, in fact, have compounded the abuses that the individuals in question have suffered. So I'd like to talk about a case of a man named Maha Abbas al Kabaz, who was working as a bellboy in Manamar's Golden Tulip Hotel on the night where a murder in a faraway village took place. And it was known that Maha was on his shift at this hotel, but nevertheless, he was arrested for this crime. He was beaten with fists, metal wires, and rods. He was forbidden to eat, to use the bathroom, to pray. His family were threatened. And at the end of all this, he was held at gunpoint and forced to confess to this crime which took place a long distance away while he was known to be working his shift as a bellboy. Maha was sentenced to death. His sentence was ultimately upheld. And today he faces imminent execution. So this is one of the cases that Bird has done incredible work on and, and that Reprieve 
continues to work on and which we urgently seek re redress for and, and for the abuses that Maha has suffered. But I want to consider the role of the Ombudsman and SIU in Maha's case. So following his arrest, a complaint was submitted on his behalf to the Ombudsman, which I'll remind you has been trained and funded by the UK government. And it doesn't appear that any substantive investigation was carried out at all after that original complaint. In July 2018, Reprieve submitted a detailed complaint about Maha's torture and his forced confession to another UK-trained anti-torture body, which is the Special Investigations Unit. And in September 2018, the Bahraini government wrote to Reprieve saying, the SIU opened an investigation into Maha's allegations of mistreatment, but found no evidence to support these claims. So that's interesting that no evidence was found, and probably unsurprising because Maha was never interviewed. His lawyer was never contacted. There's no evidence any substantive investigation was conducted at all, and no documentation has been released from that investigation. All of those things mean this investigation falls well short of the Istanbul, uh, Istanbul Protocol, which sets out reasonable standards for these kinds of investigations, which include the need for an independent medical assessment, for the uh, person making the complaint to have disclosure of the evidence that it, it finds, None of these things were satisfied. So in this case, the Ombudsman and SIU's role appear to have been not to investigate the credible allegations of torture and forced confession in Maha's case, but rather to effectively provide a screen to say there's nothing to see here. And sadly, this fits a pattern in the cases that we work on. So in the cases which you may know about of Mohammed Ramadan and Hussein Musa, we see a similar pattern of horrendous torture and forced confession. And frankly, a somewhat farcical cycle of statements by the Ombudsman and the SIU, which say in the first instance that no complaints had been received, something that was told to MEPs at the European Parliament, while at the same time the Ombudsman and SIU were disclosing to different audiences, namely in this case um, a US advocacy organization, ADHRB, that complaints had been received. So, there's not even a consistent story as to whether complaints are going forward from the bodies themselves. And to this date, we haven't seen publicly and lawyers have not properly received the findings of the, any investigations which have gone on in these cases. So this is not a record that the Ombudsman and SIU or Bahraini government can be proud of by any stretch of the imagination. And it's certainly not a record that the British government could look at and see to be successful in terms of its aims in funding and uh, these kinds of programs in Bahrain. But despite this, the UK government still refers to the Ombudsman and SIU, as you heard earlier, as legitimate bodies to investigate these kinds of complaints, and still, astonishingly, refers to them as independent. How can we see the Ombudsman and SIU as independent when they are, in effect, directly responsible to the Ministry of the Interior? they receive all of their budget from the government of Bahrain and there are no substantive provisions in place to guarantee their institutional autonomy. So for the UK government to refer to these as independent bodies and to say that they are legitimate avenues to investigate these kinds of complaints is, uh, is baffling and unrealistic and surely unsustainable. So we would say to the UK government that there needs to be a serious reckoning and a serious consideration of whether this kind of assistance can ever benefit people like Mohammed Ramadan and Hussein Musa and Mahar Abbas when there is no structural independence of the Ombudsman and the SIU. And also when Bahrain has not ratified international agreements like the second optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture, which allows for the access of independent investigators into a country's prison system. Bahrain hasn't ratified that standard. And so surely it was always unrealistic to try and proceed with the setting up of accountability bodies like this when Bahrain's demonstrated that it has not yet met those international standards. And how Bahrain demonstrates to this day in the cases of people like Mahar Abbas just how appalling the torture and systemic abuse in the Bahraini criminal justice system can be. So we would say what we really need is full transparency about what the UK is funding in Bahrain 
and we need that funding to be conditional on tangible progress, i.e. the elimination of torture and forced confessions in the Bahraini criminal justice system. And surely the ratification of international standards like the second optional protocol to the Convention on, against torture. There's no sign the UK government is considering this right now. And in fact, as I mentioned earlier, the money the UK is spending in Bahrain has been moved out of the Conflict Stability and Security Fund, that £1 billion pot for assisting foreign security forces, and into this shadowy so-called integrated activity fund, of which we have no substantive disclosure, and which means we have no full sight of what is being spent in Bahrain right now, although we do know that it is of similar amounts to previous years. So there are many questions to answer for the British government on that front. But ultimately, whatever the standards being set right now, they fall well below what we would expect in terms of the use of UK taxpayers' money on these kinds of institutions. So we would like to see policy progress, transparency from the British government, proper conditions placed on assistance to Bahrain, but also, as, as others have said, robust public representations or private representations where appropriate on particular cases in Bahrain itself. And so we would like to see Mahar Abbas's death sentence stayed and a proper disclosure of whatever investigations have been conducted. And we would also call on, um, on the government of Bahrain and on the UK to push for a proper fair process by which uh, Mohammed Ramadan and Hussein Musa may be retried. Because right now, although thankfully their death sentences have been put aside for now, if those are just rehashed in the same flawed court proceedings as we saw in the first instance, then it's uh, just deja vu all over again. So there's clearly significant progress that needs to be made on the UK side here. And I think um, we need to see serious change from the UK government in terms of acknowledging its responsibilities and ending potential complicity in abuses like those that organizations like Bird and Reprieve work on every day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. That's very much appreciated. And we're still running on time, which is uh, uh, helpful as well. So it gives a little bit more time going into what did I say about uh, gang after glee? Um, <laughs> She's also the Secretary for the APPG and Democracy and Human Rights in the Gulf. She graduated from the London School of Economics in 2017 and has continued her education by pursuing a graduate diploma in law. Over to you. Great. Uh, Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to start. So basically, I'm going to be mostly talking this evening about uh, the mistreatment of specifically female political prisoners in Bahrain. Um, and I thought, what better way to start um, my speech by hearing from one of them, from uh, Naja Youssef, um, and then later from uh, Haja Mansour, who's another uh, female political prisoner in Bahrain. So these are direct communications from these two women. If you'd like to have a listen. <laughs>
Singapore and in the Medina of Asia, Bahrain. My name is Hajar Mansur and I am a political prisoner. I was arrested on the 5th of March 2017 in retaliation for the activism of my son-in-law, human rights defender, Said Ahmed al During the interrogation period, I was subjected to torture and other violations. I was tried in a Bahraini court and sentenced to three years imprisonment. To date, I, was, I have spent 22 months in Issa Town prison, where I have been subjected to physical assault and psychological ill treatment by the head of prison, M Major Mariam al -Badi. I was deprived of my religious rights, beaten, and put in isolation. In addition, I was denied my right to family visits and phone calls for a whole week. They have placed a glass barrier in the visitation room. Therefore, I have not seen my family for the last three months. The days allocated to phone calls have been reduced to two days a week, and a prison guard monitors my call to ensure that I do not expose the violations I am subjected to. In addition, I was placed in a cell with three surveillance cameras. I am personally being monitored by Mayor Major Albadeva. I was subjected to medical negligence, the confiscation of my family photos and books, and I, I was not allowed to participate in some of the workshops offered by the prison. I am not allowed to drink water whenever I need. My dignity is being undermined in retaliation for the activism of my son-in-law, Said Ahmed Awadari. I am now extremely worried for, about other inmates who are being punished because of me. An inmate was placed in solitary confinement for 10 days as she had received some food from me. Two other inmates were not allowed to smoke for a week after I gave them the number of the National Institute for Human Rights. I have learned that some inmates have been given the right to visit their families without the glass barrier due to their family status. Clearly, this policy of discrimination has been implemented to restrict us. To conclude, I ask the concerned authorities to help me get visita full visitation rights. I miss my children and my family, and I want to see them. Hajar Mansour is a town prison. But I will do my best uh, to summarize overall the situation. Um, so first of all, yes, thank you so much for coming along this evening. Um, it's great to see such an excellent turnout, and of course the cameras. Um, it's great to know that this will be heard and seen by so many people around the world. Um, we've heard already from our um, previous speakers about the cruelty and the brazen lack of respect with which the Bahraini judicial system uh, treats the country's activists and human rights defenders. Um, Twelve of those people, um, the people whom the Bahraini government has chosen to target, are women. Uh, they are female political prisoners uh, who have remained at Bahrain's notorious Isa Town prison, of which we have already heard, for months, some of them for years, um, as a punishment for their attempts to express themselves freely or to associate with those who do so. Um, I want to start by telling you a story. Um, like the men who are in prison for the same imagined crimes, uh, these women face unimaginably terrible mistreatment. I'd like you to understand, I think it's really important to understand, how assault and rape are being used as weapons against these women um, and against anyone who would speak out against the injustices that they face. When Najar Youssef, from whom you've just heard, was arrested in April 2017 for criticizing Bahrain's hosting of the Grand Prix, um, she tells us that officers from Bahrain's National Security Agency subjected her to days of physical and psychological abuse, uh, sexual assault, rape threats, threats that her young sons would be killed, as we have heard. When Najar refused to sign a pre-prepared confession, she suffered further threats, including that of further sexual assault. Since those events took place, Najar has failed to have her ordeal even recognized and acknowledged within the Bahraini court system, but her abuse and that of her fellow prisoners has continued. Uh, this trend, which started with her abuse, has only intensified since 2017. As some of you may remember, um, we were fortunate enough uh, last September to get enough support from British MPs to hold a debate in Parliament about uh, the situation regarding human rights in Bahrain, uh, with the help of reprieve, of course. Um, this event gave us a golden opportunity to raise the cases of these female political prisoners, but only a few days after details about this event were posted on Parliament's website, um, three of the women at Easter Town Prison 
that's Najjar, that's Hajar, from whom you also heard, and Medina Ali um, were assaulted brutally in the prison. Uh, Haja, for some context, she is 50 years old. Um, she is the mother-in-law of Sayyid Awadai, who is Bird's Director of Advocacy. Um, just a few days before this brutal assault took place, in which Haja was beaten and later had to be taken to hospital, um, the UN had issued a report referring to her imprisonment as a direct reprisal against Sayyid, her son-in-law's work, as she was referring to there. Since this assault, further restrictions have been placed upon these three women. Um, they are now locked in their cells for up to 22 hours a day, um, and they're forced to choose between calling their families and calling their lawyers. Um, really, that is exactly how it works. Uh, one call with a lawyer in prison means one less call available for um, children, husbands, parents, family members. Um, and to be honest, the family calls, the number of calls with family that were um, allowed to these women in the first place were pretty scarce to start with. In mid-December of last year, um, the prison went even further. Uh, now, any inmates who have contact with these three women, uh, no matter how minimal or innocuous that contact is, um, are punished as well. Um, as you heard, um, one instance saw an inmate placed in solitary confinement for two weeks after Haja shared a bag of crisps with her. This solitude, of course, is only part of the despairing conditions that these women face. Um, they have not seen their families since the assault took place last year. Um, for the past five months, as you heard, a glass barrier has been placed in the visitation room to separate uh, the inmates from their families. The women refuse to accept this, of course they do. They said it would break their hearts to see their children or their elderly parents behind a glass barrier and not be able to hug or comfort them. So you can see from what I've said, the process of isolation of this, these women is now almost entirely complete. Let's think for a second. Who can you go to? Who can you count on as a woman in Easter Town Prison? Can you go to the prison authorities if you have a grievance or concern? No, of course you can't. They could terrorise or beat you, perhaps. Can you go to your lawyer? If you wish to use one of your precious, rare phone calls to call them, then maybe. But how much can a lawyer be helpful when the abuses that you face are so inherently political in nature, not even necessarily illegal under Bahraini law? Since no apparent administrative or security threat has arisen to mandate the restrictions against Najjar, Hajar, and Medina, these restrictions contravene the Mandela rules. That's the UN uh, standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners. But Bahrain denies that. So where can you go? Can you go to your lawyer? No. Can you go to your family? You can barely even get a chance to talk to them. So what's left? Where can you go? As Lloyd eloquently explained, and Diane has as well, um, the British government will tell these prisoners to go to Bahrain's own oversight bodies to resolve their concerns. Um, the Ministry of Interior Ombudsman, for example, which is a British-funded body, as Dan explained. But this Ombudsman has, as we've heard, failed to address most of the concerns brought to it. Uh, in fact, a sing it has not addressed a single one of the concerns that Haja has brought to it for the past 18 months. And when Haja provided two fellow prisoners with contact details for another one of these bodies, um, the NIHR, um, two inmates were punished further for talking to her, as we've heard. So where does that leave us? That means that basically we are the only source of help available for these women. By we, I mean the media, the British Parliament, uh, activists and non-profit professionals who, armed with the horror stories that we hear from these prison inmates, can embarrass the Bahraini authorities into taking action. But the last time these cases were raised, let's remember, at the debate last year, the women were punished because of our efforts. Our freedom of expression, too, was challenged, even punished, by the Bahraini regime. In August 2018, Haja found a painful lump in her breast. She received medical, exam medical attention rather at the time, but the authorities have since refused to disclose the results of her exams, meaning they're essentially unhelpful. The lump has since grown and is no longer painful, which makes her even more worried, um, as any of us might be in that situation, that it might be cancerous. She has been requesting private medical attention, which she is willing to pay for, but her requests have gone ignored. So Haja faces near total isolation at one of the most frightening times of her life, a health crisis. 
This is exactly the attention of those, intention rather, of those at Easter Town Prison. But we cannot allow that to happen, that isolation. The British Parliament and the media are these women's last recourse, and we cannot be cowed into shutting the last door open to them. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you, Lily. Um, and I think on that note, I have to wish you all a good evening because we've run out of time. Thank you very much for everything. <laughs>